Okay, so a little bit more about my military career. Uh, last time I spoke to you, um, I've been posted to Black Watch and then the Royal, uh, the Scot sorry, the Royal Scots took over from a little place called Verl in Germany, it's near, near Zost, uh, not far from the Mona Dam. So I spent a lot of time down at the Mona Dam, it was great. So my next posting, um, I was a full corporal by this time and my next posting was up to the north of Germany at a place called Munsterlager, uh, Dennis Barracks in Munsterlager, so not far from Fallenbostel, uh, just up the road again from Saltau training area, so those of you that have been out there know Saltau, but um, Munsterlager primarily was used as the Mortar concentration, the artilleries and the mortars used to fire into Munsterlager training area. Now, uh, three two armed engineers, like I say, they were based in uh, Dennis Barracks. Not far down the road from us was actually the German tank regiment's uh, training unit. Yeah, so, all the German soldiers that were going to be involved in, uh, in their tank regiment all got posted there and we had a good relationship with the uh, with the Bundeswehr yeah a good bunch of lads uh, normally when we crashed out of Dennis Barracks you'd find chiefs and tanks strewn all the way down the road and I'll never forget um, I was looking at a tank and this leopard tank pulled up alongside us and the German commander looked at me, looked at the state of the ground underneath the chieftain and said to me, uh, do all your tanks leak oil like that? And I looked at him and said, yeah, mate, they do. But, uh, but they were quite surprised. We got invited, the workshops at 3 2 um, um, engineers, got invited to visit the Bundeswehr. And if, you know anything about chieftain, I would imagine uh, it's the same with anything nowadays. Pack lifts on the engines were a bloody nightmare. They really were. The amount of time you spent uncoupling this, undoing that, was incredible. And the Germans invited us to do a pack lift on a leopard tank. What a joy that was. Uh, we just undid the back plate. Yeah, the engine came out on rollers, there was umbilical cords for the oil, the electrics, the water. You just disconnected that and out come the engine. Unlike the Chieftain tank where, like I say, you virtually had to strip the tank down to, uh, to get it out. But while I was with 3-2 Armed Engineers, um, it was one of the officers from 3-2. Um, I thought about Chieftain being used as a bridge layer. Uh, he'd done all the designs and everything. And the next thing was he needed the roomy assistants to do the prototype. So we ended up, there's myself, a couple of the Amex, uh, which are tank mechanics, and the metal smith. Yeah, working with this officer and looking at the way that we could uh, make this chieftain, yeah, a bridge layer, same as they'd had before with um, with the old Centurion. Yeah, obviously what we also had at 3 to Iron Engineers was the Centurion Avery, Armoured Vehicle Rural Engineers or the dustbin chucker as we used to call it, because the turret on there had a very stumpy barrel and the ram that came out, which was for destroying bridges, was literally like a dustbin. So it was known as a dustbin chucker. And thanks to my work with Ron Bridgewater at the Scots Lagoon Guards, um, I obviously knew how to deal with the Centurions. Now, during the Gulf War, and I remember it very well because I wasn't far away, um, one of the Avery's caught fire 
and actually exploded. Now, we were a good five, ten mile away from them. We heard it go up. We also saw the night sky light up as the thing exploded. Luckily enough, the crew got out before the whole tank went up. But my time at um, Munchlager was really good. Uh, I'd been there before. I'd been to what was a place called Trowan Camp, which is where the mortar platoon used to go when I was attached to the Black Watch and the uh, Royal Scots. So I knew Munchlager fairly well. Uh, the Mary Quarters area for us in Munchlager wasn't far from the impact area for where the artillery and the mortars used to fire into. And during my time there, it was the Americans that had been firing into Munchlager and managed to drop one short and it landed in the field not far outside where our Mary quarters were. Unfortunately, there was a grandmother who was walking her two grandchildren in the fields and got caught in the explosion. Uh, they all survived, however, the little lad um, was injured so badly, he was in a body cast, a full body cast. Uh, um, his father was flown back from Canada because his father was on excise, uh, on excise bed man in Canada. And uh, the Americans treated him extremely well. A lot of compensation, uh, a lot of medical assistance was given to him which was good. But uh, Munchlager for me, one of the things I'll always remember is I had a young craftsman in my electrical section uh, called Craftsman Glue, or you can imagine we called him Sticky um, for obvious reasons. Now it was in the day when D Ream was in the charts where they used to sing their song, and I'll never forget Sticky used to sing it all the time. He said, things can only get better, now I found glue. Yeah. So I remember Sticky really well. But uh, again, I was there in Munchlager probably two years. Unfortunately, I would got promoted and I was posted out of Germany back to Catterick to 15 field workshops but I never ever thought I'd go back to Germany again after going back to Catterick and years later on sure enough I was back in Germany so that's my posting out there with 3-2 armoured engineers or 3-2 armoured farmers I know when they closed down uh, Munzelager 3-2 uh, moved into Hona uh, and were serving there and 3-2 again came out during the Gulf War uh, they were the guys that created the breach for us to go through into Iraq and if you don't know about how we liberated Kuwait you can find a lot of the information in lot online but we actually invaded Iraq to then swing right to come in and liberate Kuwait and it was the British forces that took on most of the Republican Guard. Yeah. And if you've ever seen anything about the Gulf War, yeah, you'll understand that um, those guys, guys were totally defeated. But three to armoured engineers, great bunch of guys. While I was there, um, I actually taught boxing to, uh, to HQ Squadron. And one of the guys, he was the middleweight champion, yeah, then went on to box for the army uh, and became the army's middleweight champion. And it was in 2000, I think it was 2003, 2004. I was working for the BBC doing my golf stuff and one of the crane drivers came and saw me and said, Oh, Nobs, how you doing, son? I looked at him, I didn't recognise him. And it was Charlie, who I'd uh, trained to box in the Inter, 
squads and competitions. He then, like I say, went on to become the Army's middleweight champion. Great lad. But, uh, so that's that posting. Like I say, I got moved on to Catrick. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll give you another taster of my life whilst I was in Catrick at a later date. So I'm going to carry on doing my little tab. You can see, look at this, hey. This is what I can get out to. Yeah, this reservoir down there, there's various other walks uh, and what I'll probably do when I'll get a bit more uh, strength, I'll probably take you out on one of the other walks because they are a bit longer uh, and a bit uh, more arduous. So take care everyone and I shall catch up with you soon.